little spirit baby starts showing up night after night after night. And he shares that right now, there's a generation of us that have scoured the cosmos and decided that this is the time we want to come to Earth. We're here to show you a new way of being human, a new consciousness. We're blanketing the Earth with a new wave of light, with a new consciousness that will emerge as a new way of being human. My boy showed this beautiful scene and he said, look at each of these orbs, each of these spirit babies. We've each scoured the cosmos and chosen, chosen a precise time and a precise permutation of circumstances to incarnate into the perfect families in these coordinated ways. Geographic location, planetary alignments, the perfect parents, the perfect relationships between the moms and dads and community members, so that at the perfect time, a time code will get unlocked and we'll all find each other to collaborate and co-create a new way of doing human, a new way of, of creating this new society. This education conversation, I hope that we get an opportunity to chat more. A lot of it is that is is really inspiring us to go back through and clean up our past upbringing too, so that we can all step into this new way of being human that these kids are leading us into, but we're all doing it. Whether you have children or not, whether you're a teacher and educator, we're all doing the same work right now, you know? You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello, welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. Always a blessing to present another show for you today. And please remember, if you're liking the show, as I say this, well, actually, I don't say it all the time, but I forget to say it, but I'd love you to subscribe. I'm trying to get that subscription up because I have to, to reach fundraiser level, I have to reach 10,000 and I have been on YouTube for 15 years and my show hasn't grown as much as other shows. So if you could support the show, I'd really appreciate it and tell your friends about it. I'm on a, I'm on a passion to reach 10,000, but I have one of the most delightful cats drinking my water and one of the most delightful women to introduce you to today, healers and Cosmic Goddess, Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan. Welcome to the show, Edith. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and to the audience. Thank you so much for having me in your home, in your living room, in your kitchen, um, <laughs> while you're out on a walk. Um, I hope to share some beautiful energies together in this conversation. Oh, Brandon introduced Brandon's always sending me people for the shows. Actually, we swap people all the time. But the beautiful Brandon Thomas from Expanding Reality introduced Edith and I. And because I've forgotten, because so many people reach out to be on the show, I can't always remember where they come from. And I've been watching Edith on other shows today, just blown away by your story and, and what you're doing in the world. Like you are just a, just love you. You're a star. I love you already. But let me tell people a little bit about you. And what you've been up to for your full story, I was watching you on the Jeff Myra podcast where you go into your story extensively. So we won't go into all of it today. And if you're interested in more of Dr. Edith's story, you can watch her on the Jeff Myra podcast. She's actually all over the place on many podcast shows. But Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan's spiritual journey began when she was four years old. But after excelling at college and in the corporate world, in 2003, Edith had a series of meditation induced mystical experiences which changed her life forever. Her perception of human potential and possibilities expanded. 
as she saw who we really are and can be when we remember our multidimensional spiritual nature. Since then, she's devoted her life to unlocking the secrets of our human potential, weaving together ancient wisdom such as Chinese medicine and Qigong with the new science of consciousness, medicine and spirituality. Today, Edith is a teacher of consciousness and human potential, a holistic medicine doctor, an author, speaker, coach, mama of two amazing children and creator of the groundbreaking Luminous Education Revolution. Her first book, Super Wellness, Wellness Training for the New Humanity, features a forward by the fabulous Wim Hof. We love Wim Hof down here. Everybody's in ice baths all over the place and conscious festivals. As a powerful distillation of her first 15 years in clinical experience. Her is it upcoming, your upcoming book, or have you finished yes. it yet? If it, so it's not finished yet. Second book, Luminous Kids and Luminous Education, will explore humanity's transition into the new paradigm of awakened living with a focus on children, education, parenthood, and family life. It draws inspiration from her personal journey of conscious conception which we'll chat about today, fabulous story, home birth, child-led self-directed education, homeschooling, unschooling, which is interesting, community building and holistic family life. It aims to spark a new conversation about our evolution in consciousness as a human family. In 2021, you launched the Luminous Education Revolution program, which we'll talk about after we hear a story, supporting families in transition, going into new paradigms of education, self-directed learning, village building, and awakened parenthood. And you can find more about Dr. Edith at dredithubuntu.com. So when did you add Ubuntu to your name? Well, the story is that when all my life I was called Edith and I didn't really resonate for some reason, you know, Edith is an old English grandma name. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Hong Kong. And so my family with the British influence in Hong Kong, I have a beautiful Chinese name called Yida, Yida in Mandarin or Yida in Cantonese, which is actually a quote from the Tao Te Ching. And it's a really beautiful using the um, the in Tao Te Ching means um, virtue. There's a passage in there that says that if somebody, quote, wrongs you, the best, quote, revenge is to treat them with kindness and virtue. And to, to cultivate virtuousness is, is considered the best kind of like social activism or revenge that you can do, like to actually show an example of a more beautiful possibility is the best quote, revenge. That's kind of what that passage is talking about. So as a child, I thought it was kind of cheesy. And then my 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 parents didn't know what Edith meant. They just knew that it sounded phonetically kind of like my Chinese name. And there was no internet back in the day. So they said, oh, Edith, you know, we grow up in British colony, um, Hong Kong, and we'd heard the name Edith. So I was just named Edith. As an adult, I looked up the word Edith on the internet. And do you know what it means? Do you have any friends named Edith? Maybe you have a grandmother or yeah. a grandma or somebody named Edith. I can't think of anyone at the moment. What does it mean? It's always fun to look up the name of your name and be like, hmm, what is it? What 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 is it about this name? Does it resonate for me? And it didn't resonate at first. It meant the spoils of war. As in you go to war and you rape and pillage and you rob whichever village that you just raped and pillaged. The spoils of the war is called Edith. Wow. I did not know that. I, my jaw dropped and <laughs> I told my family, I said, I don't want to be named that. That's my name. I, I need a new name. So I set about finding a name and I've been in spiritual circles and half of my friends have hippie spiritual names, you know, <laughs> so I was like, I need I a better know. name, a better spirit, hippie spiritual name. And then one day I hear, I believe Desmond Tutu um, talking about this African concept, Ubuntu. And then I start seeing Ubuntu everywhere after that. 
you know, once like it, that's how it works, isn't it? Once you become aware of something, you see it everywhere. Yeah. And it had been a number of years before that um, a psychic that just for fun at a party said, you know what, Edith's not your real real name. I keep hearing some sound like um two um two something. I don't know. It sounds like that. And I was like, that's kind of weird. What's um two? You know. So later I hear Ubuntu, I look it up and it was the perfect antidote to Edith. And many people probably know Ubuntu is a popular word now. It means I am what I am because of what we all are, or I am because we are. And it was like, oh, it was a breath of fresh air. As soon as I heard the energy of that felt so perfect and it felt exactly like the medicine to harmonize the Edith. So for a while, I just went by Ubuntu amongst my friends, but professionally on all the documents and paper, I was already Edith. All my diploma said Edith. So for a while, we started just calling me Edith Ubuntu together. And then I was telling this story to a friend and she said, that is so beautiful, actually, because isn't that what we're all here doing? We're here, my good friend Charles Eisenstein speaks so eloquently about this transition that humankind is going through from the story of separation to the story of interbeing, right? And some people call it from, you know, divisiveness into unity consciousness, from war to peace. That's what we're all here doing. That's the name of the game right now. And I said, Edith. Ubuntu is the perfect theme for what yeah. I came here to experience for this lifetime. I freaking love my name now because Maybe. I started realizing that the only way to actually win the war, yeah. Edith, the only true winnings of a war is to come to the Ubuntu consciousness. Exactly. And Ubuntu now, it doesn't matter. Now people call me Edith. I just hear the same thing. The only way that we could win a war is to come to peace and harmony with each other. So yeah. I love my name again. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say maybe or Ubuntu is the spoils of war because when you go through the horrendous experience of war, you know, you have to come back to the realization that we're all in this together. We've got to stop fighting each other and making each other wrong and work co collaboratively, collectively rather than separately. So maybe Ubuntu is the spoils of war. Yeah. Lately, I've been um, here, here in our area, there's, there's been just with things being so strange the last three years with shutdowns and different political agendas at play. There's so much political divisiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and the last the last past year, especially, I've really been dropping into the surrender of being completely burnt out from the divisiveness. Mm -hmm. I feel burnt out from it. And the beauty of being burnt out is like, I don't want to fight anymore. I just mm -hmm. want us to be human and to be kind and to be peaceful and to be loving with each other. And so sometimes... Sometimes we have to be kind of burnt out from that energy to drop fully into surrender for this beautiful new energy to take over our lives again. Absolutely. And people out there like pro jab, anti jab and pro this, anti this. And, and I've just found myself and a lot of my friends just softened all of that and said, you know what, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. What is, what is the future of humankind that we want to live on this planet? Exactly. We're past the eleventh hour at this point, you know. <laughs> As they say, we're no longer at the eleventh hour. This is the hour. It's time for us to heal our hearts and come back together and and this birth is the a hour. more beautiful world. Yeah, there's so much to your story. It's so extensive. But what I want to focus on today is a bit of your awakening experience, because I, I found that was just so beautiful, like remembering who we are and um, and your education up on the ships. I thought that was beautiful because as I was listening to you on Jeff's show, I'm like, oh, the ETs are teaching her what I teach in energy healing workshops. And I'm like, that's so cool. And of course, the babies, the revolution, the luminous education revolution and your experience, pre-birth memories of your son and talking to your son before he was born. I had this beautiful teacher on the show. Now, am I going to remember her name? It'll come to me, who called herself a, um, 
a medium who would talk to souls before they entered the earth as opposed to souls that had, you know, left the earth, a pre, wow. what does she call it? which is what you were doing. But anyway, let's hear a bit about your awakening experience. There, there have been a series of them, but the first big one happened in 2003. I was, um, I believe I was about two thirds of the way done with my first Chinese medicine degree. I have two Chinese medicine degrees. And when I started Chinese medicine school, after I had left my software corporate work, one of my favorite things about the education in Chinese medicine school is that it's not just philosophical. It's not just academic. For example, when you practice acupuncture, when you practice manual therapy, you have to become sensitive and energy aware. And it was a required part of a training to do Qigong class and Tai Chi class. And almost all of our teachers had some background in Qigong and Tai Chi. So there's a certain level of energy awareness in how everybody operated in the school that was an example of a new possibility of how to be human that I really appreciated, not just philosophizing about it, but a beingness that I experienced for really the first time in a whole environment of everybody being aware of qi, very refreshing. So Qigong class was always my favorite because let's face it, every time you just sit down and take a few deep breaths and become conscious and aware of your breath is always a win. So it was always my favorite class that regardless of what was planned for the lesson, I knew I would always come out feeling better from the class. I know that I could just always get some peace and stillness and inner tranquility and insight and intuition in every single practice. So for those, I know your audience is pretty advanced, but those that are new to Qigong, the definition of Qigong is basically any kind of meditative practice where you focus on the breath in a very conscious and intentional way. And you're focusing on, they call it the yin yin, your intention. There's a specific guided part of your intention to guide and work with the flow of energy in a very intentional way. And then there's the physical movement or physical posture or mudra or something that you're doing intentionally to set up the physical circuitry in your body. So anytime you're doing these three things simultaneously in a conscious and intentional way, that's called qigong. So you could be doing walking qigong, you could be doing paperwork, but as long as you're conscious of the energy flow, your breath and your physical posture, that's considered qigong. So in this particular class, I was doing this Qigong practice and the teacher was guiding us with a guided visualization and meditation. And just like usual, I follow along, I'm feeling peaceful, I'm focusing on my breathing. And for some reason, to this day, is still kind of a mystery. I drop deeper and deeper and deeper until one moment I drop so deeply that I experience a flash and I exploded. I experienced myself exploding into trillions and trillions of pieces of love and light. I had no reference point for anything like this. I had had beautiful experiences of getting tranquil and peaceful and calm, but suddenly now I lost my body. There was no time. There was no space. I was the size of the entire cosmos. And prior to the meditation, the teacher said, hold a question that you want some clarity about, some answers about. And in this space, it was this strange thing that I have a hard time articulating, but I know your audience would understand the meaning underneath the words, because words are too small to describe such experiences. It was like, I realized that I was home and I had returned to our true natural state of pure love and pure light. And this question that I had was like a joyous laughter at having the question because the answer was so obvious. And it was like, there was no more questions. All questions were answered. So sometimes I use words like it was pure love, it was pure light, but it was like the deepest contentment. It was the most satisfying, fulfilling, contentful, um, 
full experience because I remembered who I really was. I, I realized that I went home and that this experience of pure love and pure light is who we really are on the deepest level. I don't know how long I lasted in this state. It was this intense experience of, of this explosive energy of love. So much love, so much love, so much love. There's no time, there's no space, but far away at some point I heard this voice. And then I was like, what is that voice? wait a minute, there's a Qigong teacher in San Francisco teaching a Qigong class. Wait, there's a girl named Edith Chan. She's a Chinese medicine student sitting in a room somewhere doing a Qigong practice. And there was this little thread of connection to that whole situation there. And then it was like this, this started saying, should we go back to that? And that was the very interesting experience of it feels so absurd to take trillions and trillions of pieces of love and light to try to condense it into a pretense of a physical human body. What a ridiculous thing. That was the experience. It felt very absurd to do that. And then, but somehow I did, or it did. And it chose to return to this physicality and it was a ridiculous and almost painful but not quite experience of squeezing trillions and trillions and trillions of pieces of light that had exploded out back into the density of this form and when it finally landed there was a clashing of so many sensations that I couldn't even begin to find words to articulate it for a very long time afterwards. But in hindsight, I've come to understand that what happened was a clashing of intense, intense, intense gratitude, appreciation, love, so much appreciation that I got to go home. And intense grief and sadness and anger it was like an instantaneous knowingness that how we do things here is backwards and upside down. This whole physicalist, materialist reality was backwards and upside down. I just knew it in that instant, the moment I landed. And an instantaneous knowing that my whole life up until that point, living from the perspective of a physical materialist perspective was a giant lie. That my whole life was a lie up until that point and so avalanches of tears just came gushing and gushing and gushing and gushing down at the clashing of all these sensations and I couldn't even locomote myself barely to say what happened after the meditation that my classmates the Qigong teacher knew something very significant had happened. They could see, sense, and feel the energy change. And they could see that I was convulsing with avalanches of tears coming down like faucets, you know? And um, yeah, they were very kind and gentle with me, but I don't think anybody had anything to say to help me really debrief what was going on. And it turned into, it turned me into a seeker. I started having this insatiable thirst for understanding the true nature of reality. And that was in 2003. There wasn't so much information on the internet. So I started reading books and I started realizing, oh, there are some people that had NDE experiences. I read every single NDE book I could find to realize that some people had similar experiences to this. And gradually, little by little, traveling around the world, meeting teachers and healers and and going to retreats and workshops, meeting people like um, Jazz Muheen and um, a lot of the same people that you've been working with over these last two and a half decades. And bit by bit, all these pieces started piecing together and past life regressions and dream time experiences and the um, recalling of my soul memory and going to dark room retreat with Jazz Muheen, working with Byron Katie for a period of time to really um, work through all of my stressful beliefs and self-limiting beliefs that had been programmed into me to let those go and to return to 
what feels like more in integrity to truth, which is that we are pure love, that we are one. But that sounds cheesy if it's not your direct experience of everyday life. So yeah, I would say I've spent the last two decades piecing these pieces together. And I'm so happy to share with everyone the best of what I've discovered on this journey. I love that you had the experience outside of like a car accident or what we call NDEs, that this experience is available through focus and intention. And also I'm hearing that it put you on that spiritual path rather than being like a lot of people say, you know, I wish I could have an NDE without having without dying which is exactly what you had but it's the beginning it was the beginning of your seeking as opposed to the end of your seeking (laughs) you know what I mean so yeah it created a reference point for me that had me be very calibrated towards what is closer to truth and what is further from truth and so it was a deeply uncomfortable experience I would say the first two or three years after that many people would say hi Edith how are you doing and I couldn't bring myself to lie sometime. Yeah. I'd say, if you really want to know, I feel intensely homesick. Mm-hmm. And people would be like, what? You want to like, go back to Hong Kong? Why don't we go to Chinatown and eat some dim sum Chinese food? <laughs> like, no, not that kind of homesick. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I would go into meditation to seek out that escape. For a very long time, I would meditate to seek out that escape and gradually through all of this work that I know you're committed to and your audience is committed to, I was able to ground this state while staying grounded, practical in the physical to express this meditative, expansive cosmic consciousness into the physical in a grounded, integrated way. And it took me two decades to get here. So it's, yeah. it's no joke. It's, it's a lot of work to get yeah. to this place. And I honor and respect so much you and your audience, because I know the work that this takes. Yeah, exactly. It's an invitation, isn't it? It's an invitation to find a way of expressing that love in this realm in this realm of polarity and separation and contrast. And yeah, sometimes it could take two decades, three decades, four decades, 15 lifetimes to find a way of of how to express that so that you can share this remembering with others. Yeah. 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 All righty. Well, I'd love to go into your experience with the ship experience. You call them dreams. Do you want to share with us what the ETs were teaching you about? Because it was all part of the integration and the mechanics of working with our energy systems, what they were teaching you. I would like to say, and maybe your audience can relate to this. We thought that the world was maybe going to end in December 2012. Um, And so in 2011, 2009, 10, 11, I did a lot of um, deep, spiritual work and attending many, many workshops. And in 2011, because I thought, you know, I wanted to get myself ready for whatever was to come. And it seems like we had a little bit of grace until this decade where everything really got very intense. Like this is the time now of the full lifting of the veil and the big transition is really happening right now. I think everybody who's listening knows that we can have the direct experience of it. Um, So in 2011, I um, was thinking, okay, I have about a year before the world is going to end. Let me do all, you know, go to Mount Shasta and do some spiritual retreats and meet some of my guides and all of this. And so there was this um, period of time when I had a bunch of very vivid and interesting dreams. And this particular series of dreams, I thought they were just dreams until I met Mary Rodwell, who's a mutual friend of ours. And she helped me to understand that actually the majority of contact experiences happen just like mine. That it's not like you, your physical body went missing and then you saw a ship. It's, it, we experience it in a multidimensional way. The way that we know that was probably a contact experience, according to her, is that I was a very deeply changed person after that. My experience of reality and sensitivity to energies and so on was was changed quite a bit and very palpably and immediately. So it started like this. It was a series of four dreams. 
by this time, I have a, um, established a very stable Chinese medicine practice. So I work with people on an energetically sensitive level already. So one night I wake up and in I'm in my dream and I realized that I was lucid, that I was in a dream state, but I look and there's my body on this very futuristic looking um, surgical table. It was a kind of metal, but it seemed very lightweight. It's not thick and clunky, but it was also very stable. And all around are all of these beings of different um, heritages, like some of them human, some of them non-human. And there was a moment in which I experienced myself, ah, I've been abducted. And then it was like, no, the energy is not like that. The energy is so respectful. So that was around the time I was doing a lot of Byron Katie work. I had the, ah, did I get abducted? Is it true? Can I absolutely know it's true? And, and I was like, no, I'm not sure that I was abducted. And suddenly I realized, oh, I decided to come here to have some uh, collaborative assistance in clearing and upgrading my system. And then I look, these cosmic brothers and sisters were in deep respect and deference to me. And they said, Edith, what would you like to do now? Now that we've opened your crown and cleared out all this, the whole tree of stressful thoughts, like a network of stressful thoughts got surgically energetically cleared I was like thank you well what are my choices and they gave me a few different options of um, uh, different types of membranes that I could put on top um, to com complete the crown and I don't remember all the choices but what I chose was this this what seems like a very like very natural organic membrane that could seamlessly integrate with my system and feel just like natural you know it's like that one looks like the most natural choice let's do that one and so I'm like okay so it is it is done and it was very quick and it was like it was very loving and harmonious and friendly and supportive and deeply respectful and I was very grateful for the assistance and then bing the alarm wakes me up and oh it's time to go to work but my goodness all day I felt my clients must have thought I was a little crazy I kept being like what's going on here because there was a giant wind tunnel that I could feel like a nostril that was breathing and breathing and breathing all day. But if I touch, there's my, it's just my regular skull. It's exactly the same. So I'm like, I had a funny dream last night. And now I feel like I have a wind tunnel, a big nostril that's breathing all day here. How strange. Well, I thought that was just going to be a one-time thing, but that's next night. I went to sleep and boom, I'm on the same ship again. And this time I'm, guided again very with so much honor and respect like this way please and I got um brought to an area where I was invited to dunk in this liquid light bath and it was so it was like a spa treatment and I saw this being and that being I was like, hey we were in Shasta together weren't you at that workshop with me too and so the same friends that I saw in the 3D were also on the ship in the same dream with me and it was just so much fun you know I was like wow this is the coolest dream I, I was totally lucid that I was dreaming and I said this is the best dream ever I hope I remember it and so we're just uh, dunking ourselves in this spa treatment of this liquid light that was just bathing our systems and clearing our channels. And you could feel it melting away all the calcifications and all the stiffness and all the hardness. And then we came out of this bath. It's like, ah, what a nice treatment. And then boom, I woke up and next day, go back to work. It was a normal day. And again, I still had that wind tunnel experience, but my whole system felt softer and more clear and clean. And my energy flow felt more inhibited. I thought these, I had two amazing back-to-back -back dreams. This was the coolest ever. Well, it happened the third night. I went back and I'm in the same ship again, a different part of the ship. And this time, um, 
I'm in a physiotherapy, a PT segment where they're teaching you how to use your new, in this case, crown chakra. So I had um, upgraded crown chakra, I can understand that just like if you have a new organ, a new part, you need to exercise it to learn how to create dexterity and strength and agility with it. And so you heard me share on uh, the Jeff Mara show, they were um, saying, you know, you can sing songs with your crown. I said, no, really? That's cool. So they we did the do, 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 do. And you can do a little orchestra with the other people. And then I realized that um that it wasn't just sounds, but geometric patterns of light coordinated with the sounds that we can project at the same time. And then I started realizing that you can have a bi-directional experience of receiving and transmitting information, interacting with the cosmos. And I was just working with the crown and gradually I started getting more dexterous the way that, you know, some people say, well, what, what do you do with your crown chakra? It's like, well, what do you do with your hands? infinite possibilities once you know how to kind of become dexterous and have some skillfulness with it there's infinite possibilities and so boom I woke up from that and I still had the wind tunnel experience in my crown but now I was conscious when I went to work that I was receiving and transmitting information I could actually see sense and feel the geometric patterns and the the not audible to other people, but audible to me, sound vibrations that was being um, transmitted. So that was very cool. The fourth night, I couldn't believe it. Back to the ship again. And I was shown, look, all of your other chakras, try the same PT practices with your other chakras. And you'll see that there's a different qualitative energy from your heart and from the other chakras and just play like this but now you've got access to this crown one and then now see how you can tune into the matrix of energies that is already in the cosmos and do a collaborative um, orchestra of sounds and lights with your friend here and then I just started seeing how all of these dimensions and levels layer together to create the matrix of energy, sounds, and frequencies, and light patterns that is the underlying matrix of the physical reality that we understand to be in existence in this reality. And once I kind of saw a few examples of how to dance with the lights and sounds and play with it, now I felt okay, I'm open to all the infinite possibilities of this now. And then they said, okay, congratulations, you're complete. You can go back to your world now. And that was it, four dreams. And I thought I had the coolest four dreams of anybody ever. I'm so happy about these dreams. And for years, I thought they were just cool dreams until Mary Rodwell came into my life. I shared a little bit and she said, oh, that sounds like a contact experience. Oh, wonderful just just wonderful god bless mary yeah uh, everything that you've spoken about you know we're talking about this evolution revolution in education needs to be taught to every human being i reckon starting at school you know the dexterity the malleability the deliberateness in how our energy vortices expand and contract and we're doing it all the time as we're thinking and feeling and engaging in stressful thoughts or being excited. Our energy vortices are expanding and contracting, but can we be deliberate? Can we know the mechanics of it and be deliberate when we're feeling sick? Can we expand and empty out a chakra or energy vortice? Can we, can, if we're feeling too sensitive, can we contract and, you know, wrap our energy around us so that we're not picking up on everyone else's energy? Just, all needs to be taught in education, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, some of um, a lot of the work that I do with the education work is to create a more um, well-rounded, comprehensive look at what it is to be a human and therefore what is the education, not the schooling, but the education education you might know and your audience might know means the bringing out or the drawing out of something from the inside out yeah. not 
propaganda and you know like like conditioning and old stressful programming from the outside in is a drawing out from the inside out so what is the education of the future as we enter into being a more expansive um more awakened and more um, luminous kind of possibility for humankind there is some um, of course taking beautiful care of your health and of course energy awareness energy and intuitive awareness, awareness and <clears throat> spiritual awareness not just the old idea of iq you know yeah when you were talking about dipping into the pools of light years ago many years ago i came across it's a long story i came across an energy healer and i had a reading from her and then she was outside of the city that i live in she was in the country and then she came in to do a talk in the city and she did a talk at a house and she was talking we had this break and she sort of looked at me and quizzically said you know well, well what do you think of the talk and i said hmm. well i think you're holding back like because she wasn't used to doing public talks. I think she was really dumbing down her knowledge because the reading I'd had with her had been so expansive. And then this talk was very mundane. And I, she goes, really? And I said, yeah, could just kind of let go and just tell people what you know. So after the break, she came back and she talked about, you know, being, she didn't talk about, I don't remember what it was so long about, I don't know if it was up on ships, but being at night, having these pools of liquid light and dunking yourself into different pools of liquid light, just like you talk. And, you know, I've never heard anyone else speak about it. You and her. Wow, the thank, only, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I haven't heard others talk about it either. Although, yeah. um, you know, there were other people on the ship who dunked in these, these tubs of light. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, years ago, many of my friends took people off to see, the John of God phenomena in Brazil <laughs> no longer exists, but uh, and they had this technology given to them, the light beds of, you know, beaming light onto different chakras. And they were saying that that technology was given to them by the ETs, like this light technology. Yeah, this, this light technology. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. I think we're just coming to understand light technology, you know, how light and sound can be such a massive healing tool. Yeah, and also the um, you know, years ago I was teaching energy healing, that expand expanding and contracting the chakras mm -hmm. at will. But let's get into let's get into the um experience with your with your sons and how they came to you before they were born and chatted to you. Do you want to speak about that? Yeah, I have an eight and a half year old boy and a three and a half year old girl now. So oh, one girl. boy and one girl. one girl. And it started because right after 2013, having a profound life-changing experience at the dark room retreat of Jazz Muheen, I attended an 11 day retreat where we spend nine days and nine nights in complete darkness with Jazz Muheen. She was very dear to me. When I came back from the dark room, it was another big leap in my journey of expanded possibilities, awakening sensibilities and sensitivities that I didn't have before. And so when I came back to San Francisco to my Chinese medicine practice, working with clients and patients, I found myself seeing, sensing, feeling into layers of their physiology much more clearly without having so much guesswork. So it was very practical for life to just zero in. Oh, I see the energy pattern. Here's what's going on. And I always back up with asking them clinical questions. And, you know, as a professional, you don't just rely on intuitive knowing you have to try to back it up with some other data points too. And I noticed myself having a much better clinical efficacy there. But at night, that sensitivity I didn't know yet how to turn off, to your point. I hadn't really practiced having so such openness and so much more details of information coming in. I didn't quite know how to close it yet. So I didn't know how to be with the apartment buildings in the city and then the neighbors and the honking and the sirens and the Wi-Fi and the 5G and it was too much energy. Ah, so loud all of a sudden. I could hear the grumpy thoughts of my neighbors when they're stressed and anxious. I could see, sense and feel all of it. It was too much. I just wanted to turn it off and I didn't know how. So 
I told my husband, I have to move out of the city. I can still work here during the day, but I have to shut it down at night and I have to live in the countryside somehow. So we found this little cottage um, on about one acre of land, a small one bedroom cottage, very humble that had fruit trees and had garden and a chicken coop. And it was just like a really nice nature filled environment. And it didn't have good cell phone reception. And it only had our Wi-Fi hub, which we turned off whenever we weren't using. You know how when you turn on your devices, you can pick up all of your neighbor's Wi-Fi signals. But here we couldn't pick up any signals except our own, which we would turn off. So the energetics of it was completely different from the city. And suddenly I felt oh, my energy field could just breathe and be natural. It's like, even though you can, you know, you could close it now that I've gained some skillfulness over the last decade, I know I can close it and strengthen it and safeguard and cocoon myself. I have more skill there, but it still takes a certain amount of work to do that. And living in that environment, I discovered so many things like, who am I if I just let my energy field be completely as free and expansive as it wants to be? that I don't have to safeguard myself against mixed energies. And then who am I when every morning I wake up and there's beautiful full spectrum sunlight? And I had explored sun gazing practices, which by the way, audience, um, I only recommend to explore it if you do a lot of deep research and really follow some um, mindfulness and safety, you know, the sun very powerful. I started doing a bit of sun gazing and at night I would sleep in complete, complete darkness, except if it's like starlights, there's no artificial light from the streets coming in. And with all of that, just barefoot on bare earth, grounding my nervous system and drinking um, unfluoridated well water instead of city water that has been processed and treated with all these chemicals, I discovered I'm a very different person. I discovered who I really am in my natural environment. I lived in Hong Kong and Boston and, you know, San Francisco, Washington, D.C. I lived in cities all my life. And for the first time to live in this kind of environment, I learned who am I in my body, my physiology and my, I hope this is not too much information, my menstrual cycles clicked into perfect clockwork 28 days every month. I could feel when my ovulation was happening, my body awareness, um, the sensitivity of should I eat, should I not eat, am I thirsty, should I drink, all of that, there wasn't this analytical, I have all these degrees in holistic medicine, so I know I should sleep eight hours a night because the science says it's good for your health. No, I just naturally, bing, wake up and enjoy the sunrise. It's a beautiful, glorious day. I don't have to set the alarm because I'm well rested and refreshed. And I don't have to discipline myself to go to sleep at night because I'm naturally just in sync with nature's rhythms. It blew my mind. I know it sounds silly, but it was an amazing experience for me for the first time living in urban environments with artificial lightings all the time. I discovered how beautiful it is to live this way in sync with nature's rhythms. And in this space, my meditations were very deep very fast. I would just drop in and I had access. So this is not just about your physical health. This is about our spiritual access. My temple got attuned in such a way that I was able to drop in very deeply in my meditative states. And every single night I'd have these wonderful dreams. And, and then in the dream state, this baby started visiting and saying, hello. In fact, he would, it would come with a bring this little sound and this flash of light. And it was always the same baby that would visit and say, I know you guys weren't planning to have children, but here I am. I'd love to be your baby. And so this baby started coming that says, you know, I know you guys weren't planning to have children. And all of your objections about not wanting to have children, they're totally valid. I agree. So where my husband and I stood with things before this is that we had not seen examples of parenthood or education that really resonated with us. You know, school was so much like a prison that we couldn't wait to get out of it. Now, I had some good education, wonderful experiences with several teachers that I am so, 
so blessed by. But on the whole, this idea of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you got to go to the building. You got to raise your hand to get permission to go to the restroom. And you can only eat during these breaks. And you here's recess. And ding, now you must do math. And then ding, now you must do English. It's actually a prison sentence. So we're like, we don't really want to, we're not into that. And then with parents, we had seen many examples of parents that were quite authoritarian, you know, sit down, shut up, you're grounded, you're punished, you know, go do your homework. Children should be seen and not heard. There was a bunch of that. And then amongst the holistic, natural, spiritual communities, some of us that don't want to be tyrannical, we saw to be very, can I just be honest, as there's like overly permissive parenting, we want them to be free and wild, but the kids are very free and wild. And it's almost like you can see they're overwhelmed because there's no structure. And so the behavior is not the always the most pretty. And we thought, you know what, then, then sometimes people will flip flop back to the authoritarian way because you got to rein them back in. And we're like, oh my God, we just, I don't think we're cut out for parenthood. Let's not have kids. So that's where we were at. We had not seen examples that we resonated with because frankly, when we are with uh, other friends, if we're planning something like a trip or go to dinner, it's always like, hey, Karen, what, um, are you gluten-free or you want to be, do you want to be vegan or paleo? Or, you know, we talk to everybody and we come up with a collaborative solution that works for everybody. And so that collaborative energy was the dominating energy in our friendships. But for some reason with children, we don't treat them that way. And so we thought we couldn't just the, sit down, shut up, you're grounded, you're misbehaving, go be quiet. And we just couldn't bring ourselves to do that. So we assumed we weren't going to be parents. So with the context of this, bring, this little spirit baby starts showing up night after night after night. And he shares that right now, there's a generation of us that have scoured the cosmos and decided that this is the time we want to come to Earth. And we've each chosen the perfect set of families to incarnate into. And we're here to show you a new way of being human, a new consciousness. We're blanketing the earth with a new wave of light, with a new consciousness that will emerge as a new way of being human. You have to take our word for it. We can't just tell you about it in the meditation. We need bodies to show you in families and communities the example of this. And so he kept visiting and it was like day after day, week after week, month after month, he kept visiting and I would look forward to going to sleep like, oh, I'm going to have a little play date with this little baby. You know, I just expected it after a while. So we really got to know each other over many months. And finally, there was this one one uh, visit where my husband would be like, la, 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 I don't want to hear it. I'm not ready for children. And this one night in which he visited and I was in half wake, half dream state. And I told my husband, hey, the baby is here again. And he's like, oh no, you know, I don't know if I wanna hear from the baby. And my boy showed this beautiful scene. And he said, look at each of these orbs, each of these spirit babies. We've each scoured the cosmos and chosen, chosen a precise time and a precise permutation of circumstances to incarnate into the perfect families in these coordinated ways. Geographic location, planetary alignments, the perfect parents, the perfect relationships between the moms and dads and community members so that at the perfect time, a time code will get unlocked and we'll all find each other to collaborate and co-create a new way of doing human, a new way of, of creating this new society. And everything that you object to about the old paradigm of parenthood and education is true. And this wave here, we will show you what the new way looks like. But this is a free will universe. You have total free will to choose to conceive me or not to conceive me. But just so you know, what you're choosing is not this nuclear family experience. Because my choosing to incarnate at this time, at this moment in your family, in this geographic location is is 
intricately coordinated with everybody else's here that you see. And he showed me this beautiful ocean, this web work of these webs of light and these orbs of light connected. And while this is happening, my entire system is experiencing waves and waves of peaceful, healing, blissful energies. And I felt my womb space was getting this etheric, energetic um, massage that was like a, a very light, bright energy that was kind of lightening up as I was experiencing all of this like my entire physiology was being um, frequency match with what was about to come so he said you have free will to choose not to conceive me but just so you know what you're choosing is he disappeared this whole scene you're not choosing the nuclear family you're choosing to participate in this web work of light so no pressure or anything. We'll just have to go back to the drawing board and figure out a new permutation for all these baby spirits to choose a different set of permutations of incarnations that works harmoniously for everybody involved. I was like, whoa. And shortly after that experience that was so profound, my, my husband was doing a yoga practice and um, he was doing Shavasana then and had a visit from our boy. So after that, he said, I, I could consider it. I'll consider it. And there was a certain day where we could feel very precisely. He was there. We had both gotten to know him so we could feel his presence and energetic signature was very palpable. He was there and we knew it was the right time that he wanted to come through. And the conscious conception experience was, it was incredible. It was a clearly a three-way merging together of an energy that as soon as he was conceived, I felt this breath, these lungs almost that kickstarted a breath cycle in my womb space. And I knew that the conception had occurred and there was no necessity to get a pregnancy test. I did anyway, six weeks later to make sure the HCG level were progressing at the healthy pace. And I didn't, um, obviously this is not medical advice, but in my own personal experience, I could penetrate and see into the womb and actually communicate with the baby. I could talk to him. I knew it was a boy. I knew he was developing healthily. I knew that he was so happy to be there. And I knew I was so happy to be there. And the whole way through the entire journey of choosing the midwife, choosing to have a home birth, choosing all of those choices were was a collaborative effort. So when he came out and we started, I had never had a baby before, but I had developed this wonderful, rich soul friendship with this little buddy of mine. So it was natural to just keep the telepathy going and saying, hey, what do you, would you like to eat? Are you hungry? Do you need a nap? And that unfolded into people saying, oh, you guys are doing co-sleeping and attachment parenting, or you're doing this, and you, are, are you doing rye parenting? all these systems that are available on the planet, I'm so grateful that there are people that speak to these holistic, mindful, conscious approach to parenting. And at the same time, I'm so um, sad about it because why do these things need to even be a system? For example, Rai is uh, to, to simplify it down, is to talk with your baby as if they're a sentient being actually say oh honey you have a wet diaper let's go change it would you like to go change it instead of just like grab the baby and put them down and change it like they're a piece of meat of course you wouldn't do that you know that there is obviously a sentient being who's not speaking uh, English language yet but they're speaking very clearly if you're present you know that they're speaking to you so I have a bit of a heartbreak that all these things had to be systems with labels and stuff when it's just our innate natural state to be present with each other, to observe and to be honoring and respectful of this infinite cosmic being that bless our families with their arrival and presence, you know. And we became a family of four after my boy was three and a half. He said, hey, do you know I have a sister? I have a sister. She needs to come now. And we tuned in and uh, similarly started conversing with her and listened for the right timing. And she arrived and yeah, we have two amazing luminous kids now, three and a half and eight and a half. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. You know, I see a time on earth in the future where every mother will have this experience. Like we'll 
come to remember our innate intuitive psychic abilities and have this clear communication with spirit who are electing to be born on earth yeah I see that happening my in- boy, yeah my boy says you know when they're four five six seven four to seven for any moms dads aunties uncles educators that's really such a sweet spot where they have the language to articulate there's not much of a filter and the veils are still very thin and he's just said so many very profound things that are very much moved me. But one of the things he says is people, you know, people, mama, people on planet Earth, they don't know how to make babies. <laughs> they think that you can just bump your peepees together and make a baby. No, 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 that's not how it works. You have to have a space baby choose you first. And the space baby jumps into the mama and papa's dreams and gives them the idea that maybe they should bump their peepees together to make a baby. <laughs> and then if there's all three of you together, that's how you make a baby. Otherwise, you bump your peepee all day. And if there's no space baby that is choosing you, there's no earth baby. Yeah, that's and so he interesting. Said, you know, when I was in space, I um I was so happy the first time I jumped into your dream, you could hear me. But a lot of the other space baby tried many, right. many times before their mamas could hear them. Exactly. The beautiful lady that I spoke to last year who called herself a prenatal medium was Jill Stein. But okay. uh, you know, her conversation went so far, but this conversation takes it so much further, you know, like we think as humans, that we have to reach out to a medium to have this connection. And you're saying we can all have this connection and we have the ability to communicate with the space babies, as you say, with the souls that are choosing us as parents. I remember with my daughter, I was in my 20s, I didn't have the understanding that I could have that communication, but I knew she was coming. And just like your husband, my my husband at the time was saying, no, we can't afford it. Wrong time to have a child. No, no, no. And then, of course, I found myself pregnant and thought he'd be really angry because I knew she was coming. Every There were so many signs. Every time I turned on the television, there was babies on television or animals with babies. And we had a gutter which had um, uh, birds nest in it and all the little babies were chirping. And my best friend had just had a baby. It's like I was surrounded by the baby thing, like she's coming. And I I remember telling him, I thought he's going to be so angry because we don't have the money and it's the wrong time. And he was so happy. But with my nephew, he came to me in a dream and said, hello, I'm coming. And that was, he's 21 this year, born on September 11, the same day as the towers came down. But my daughter's in her 30s now. But I'm feeling and dreaming about her baby coming, about about my granddaughter coming. And just like you're, you guys, I said to her, I'm I'm dreaming about I'm dreaming about a baby. I had this beautiful dream of her handing me the baby. It makes me cry. And that, like she was in some sort of hospital facility, and that sheer bliss and joy as she handed me the baby in the dream. That like I woke up in this blissful, exuberant, you know, space of having experienced that. And she's like, no. I'm not ready. Don't tell me about that. Like she's so in resistance. But this baby's, yeah, this baby's sending some messages. I'm coming. (laughs) She's like, wow, so beautiful. So beautiful. I am so happy to be alive during this time now where a conversation like this is not that far out, you know, and even totally normal people in my community. And I do, when I do my, holistic healing work um we get accountants and you know lawyers and business people and they're all open to these levels of conversations too and i get people that come to me to say you know i think we're ready to start a family i want to get myself mind body emotion soul all the levels integrated and clear i'm ready to receive this baby tell me where to start like that's you know totally regular um optometrists and accountants and lawyers and like you know people the consciousness is very different now so i'm so appreciative i'm so happy that we get to witness this transformation yeah there are so many people that stress out about wanting to get pregnant and try and then they don't and then they do and if we could all understand that we can we can have this communication with the soul and the soul's got so much to teach us 
about this decision when the timing is right, if the baby's going to come or not, like you say. But your son had a lot to teach you about the process of selecting your parents. What did he say to you about about that? There's so much that he has said, you know, since he's come in, as he started speaking, um, when he was about four, he started sharing about, you know, um, when I was in space, I was looking down on these screens and you and Baba were the last screen. And I said, that one, that one, that one. And baby and I were choosing together because I knew that if it worked out for me, we would bring her in too. So We were twin babies when we were in space. These are the words of a four-year-old. It actually started, we were reading books about space and planets and stuff. And he said, mama, space doesn't look like that. It's not empty. It's teeming with millions and millions and millions. That was the biggest word he had in his vocabulary. Millions and millions and millions of space babies. It's packed with space babies. It's not empty like they say in this book. So he started telling me, you know, there's these screens and he's very precise about the screens are triangular, but the tips of the triangles are. So when he says screens, I thought of them as rectangular, but he said, no, they're not rectangular. They're this other shape and um, and they're floating over the earth and you can zoom in and out and kind of follow along the the life of the, the families. And he even joked that, you know, when when Dave and I argue about our, like, who, you need to help with the dishes or take out the trash or whatever, the house is messy. I need some help with this. And and he said, you know, I saw, I saw you and Baba getting grumpy at each other about cleaning the house or whatever. I saw it on the screen. I was like, what did you think of that? He was like, I thought it was so funny. I wanted to jump in and see what that's about. That why do people get get irritated and cranky at each other? What what is that? So he says, when we are space babies, we only know peace and happiness. We can see that humans have sadness and loneliness and angry, cranky, all of these things. We can see it, but we don't know what that is. And that's why we jump in here to experience it for ourselves, because it seems kind of fun, actually. (laughs) Very interesting. I thought, like, he thought it was basically comedy when he saw on the screen that we'd be like, you need to take out the trash, (laughs) help with the dishes, you know. It's it's so comedy, sitcom, best sitcom show in the universe, planet Earth, I always say. (laughs) Yeah. So, so the main thing that he shared with me is that he said, you know, there's so many things because every baby chooses their perfect mamas and papas and the perfect time. And that's not up to the mamas and papas to choose. But what the mamas and papas need to do is to get their themselves as healthy as possible. And a lot of times there are babies that want to choose the mamas and papas but the mamas and papas bodies aren't very clean and healthy yet, or they're too busy, they're too tired, they're too stressed out, they're not sleeping well. So the babies try to jump into their dreams and they can't hear the information that the babies are saying. So it requires that people take really beautiful, good care of their health so that they can be still enough to hear the conversation with the babies and then to listen for the right time that the baby wants to come, you know? So the main thing he, I've asked him, what's your advice with, I because I work with families that are wanting to conceive and they're very conscious and aware and they're trying very hard, but sometimes they're almost trying too hard. There's so much stress around it, you know, and the conception experience isn't this like joyful union. It feels like homework, <laughs> you know, stressful homework. And it's not the energy that this, very advanced being needs to be conceived in. So there's a a certain level of work that we need to rise up into the frequency match for that. And what my second baby said after she was conceived, every time I tuned in to connect with her, her communications weren't so crystal clear the way my first boy was, where he would literally show his shiny bright face and have a whole telepathic conversation with me hers she would always just send me waves of peaceful loving energy and when I did communicate with her in a more detailed way she kept saying you know I could not have been conceived a moment sooner 
because there is the you guys had to level up your frequencies to be a closer match for me to be able to come in and also the planet was too far different from from where I could actually even be in the physicality That's and so, so it had to be now and there, she just sent waves and waves of love and gratitude and appreciation she said it's not just you it's all of these beings that you used to call indigo warriors and the crystals and so on the, the waves and waves as Dolores Cannon calls the waves of volunteers that had to establish this like scaffolding of matrices of increasingly elevated consciousness for this new generation of children to come in. And so she just kept sending appreciation and respect and gratitude that she said, my being couldn't have handled the density that you guys handled. So this new generation of children, I think our previous generation was able to kind of give it to the man a little bit you know like like we're not uh, kind of be a little bit of a rebel spirit these children they're such a completely different frequency match they're almost like practically allergic to the old system they're here to really bring a lot of energy and momentum in the more beautiful world that we're co-creating and moving into right now. So for example, my boy, you've probably heard me on some other podcasts, just we went to the most holistic preschool possible where it was all organic and indoor and outdoor and arts and crafts and beautiful creative music and all of this. And, and he said, I, I don't I get that. Why do I eat snacks when they say it's snack time? I eat snacks when my body says hungry, not when teacher says snack time. And he just couldn't tolerate that, that they had a, a rhythm of, okay, don't eat right now. And then ding, they play a little bell and then they sing a song and then now it's snack time. And he said, no, I listen to my body. I eat snacks when my body's hungry. I pee pee and poo poo when my body needs to pee pee and poo poo. Not when teacher says it's potty break time. And I started seeing that even though it's this really wonderful holistic space, they did have a rhythm. And I saw that he would get really into a building project. He also loved music, but they ring the bell and say, let's go to the music class, children. And we walk and we walk and they sing a song and go to the music studio. And he'd say, I've got a whole agenda here with the building. And this is, jerking me around, you know, truncating my creativity and my flow. That is, I'm, I'm about to build a masterpiece here and you're going to disrupt that so that we can do music. There's nothing wrong with music, but that's not working for me. And so I'm meeting more and more of these kids right now, now that he's older, discovering that there's a whole wave of children. I'm seeing the actual reality of what I saw in dream time nine plus years ago, 10 years ago now. What is actually happening is they're showing us and they're without being stressful or forceful, but they command a certain level of deep respect. It's like, I'm a sovereign being. I have a divine purpose, a divine curriculum that wants to express itself. I'm not buying into your old agenda that you think better. What is my dharma and my life path in this life? I already know so clearly. I remember consciously incarnating here. I remember my past lives. I remember my cosmic lineage. It's crystal clear. I have no confusion about who I am as an infinite cosmic being now choosing consciously to come into the physical to manifest beautiful ways of being. And I'm very clear about what works for me and what doesn't work for me. So you can't mess with these children. Like how much um, the old paradigm of sit down, shut up, how much chemical force are you going to use to subdue this infinite expansive light. It's almost like, like the physics of it is almost impossible at this point. So I think might as well build a new paradigm of parenting and education that actually is in harmony with what they came here to bring, you know? Oh, wow. I absolutely do know. I did listen to you speak about your son's experience with the holistic schooling. Was it preschool or kindergarten? Mm -hmm. And this morning as I was getting ready and I, it was, it, it made me think about my nephew who was born on September 11 and he didn't do 3D school and his parents were not very aware or awake or conscious. 
And so he became so rebellious, so rebellious. And he's this amazing psychic creative child that couldn't read or write and just could, just just didn't do 3D school. And I was thinking about him as I was listening to your story and thinking, wow, if only he'd been educated in a different way because now mm-hmm. he's an adult who thinks he's completely stupid because he doesn't mm-hmm. fit into the systems and structure of the 3D paradigm. But he's brilliant. And I keep telling him he's brilliant, but I'm the mad Auntie Karen who, you know, talks about all this spiritual stuff. I'm not in that sort of real world, uh, as he calls it. But as I was listening to you, I was thinking about him and I was thinking, because he doesn't know who he is or why he's here. He's a teacher. Like he went through hell at school. So he is one of those teachers that's going to teach the new curriculum. Like he's going to bring that because he's had the experience of how it didn't work for him. That's what I was thinking as I was listening to you this morning. And he would never at this point think of himself as a teacher because he thinks himself as stupid but he's brilliant yeah Yeah. there's a lot of deep healing to do let's be honest we were all to different degrees um we were conditioned to think that we were stupid if we weren't obedient to their system's agenda yeah right Mm -hmm. that that equaled stupid in their language but what I'm finding so therapeutic is the group coaching sessions and also individual coaching sessions and also those who go through Luminous Education Revolution. There's an 18 session soul searching kind of inquiry journey with inspiring teachers and wisdom keepers sharing this new consciousness of education and and parenting. I find it really helpful to just kind of start from scratch. You have lived this many years of life on planet Earth, and some of us have conscious memories of other lifetimes. And just just kind of from your perspective, not referencing others through direct experience, what is this life for? Who are you? What do you value in this life? And if you could define success, what does that look like? Because in the 3D materialistic world, success meant material like mm. how many dollars in your bank account or something, yeah. what, how big your house is, or in some cases, how many Instagram followers or whatever, these like <laughs> metrics. How many subscribers really, and likes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but in this new world as multidimensional beings that sees intelligence as not just IQ, not just how many number, uh, zeros you have in your bank account. Not that those things don't have any like importance. Sometimes they do matter based on if it's in alignment with your dharma in this lifetime. You know, like like you, Karen, you want more subscribers but you, because you're doing very deeply aligned soul work here and you want this message to get out to all the right ones that are ready to hear your beautiful message. So having subscribers matters for that. It's not, but it's not just for, to kind of like feed our egos or something, right? Like it's yeah. because it's in alignment with your life purpose or your divine purpose right now. And so- so success in the new world is something like the, a quality of inner alignment, inner attunement, inner contentment, a peace, a joy, a fulfillment with this life. Yeah. And all those physical things might support that if it feels in alignment with your divine purpose in this life. You know, so so I have people really sit in inquiry of okay, then what does it mean to be human? What do you value? What does success mean? How do you define intelligence? And really take time to expand IQ, EQ, uh, energy intelligence, spiritual intelligence, intuitive intelligence, body awareness, also being practical and street smart, creative intelligence, nature intelligence, all these levels, right? So, So then the skills, topic, and subjects that you need to be, quote, smart or capable or successful on your terms, what are those? And when people start writing those down, I bet if your nephew took time and really, you know, canceled out what the world said and just internally generated based on his observation of life and direct experience of life, yeah, it's not that math, reading and writing is not important, but what about personal finance and entrepreneurship skills and communication skills and intuition skills and the ability to um, garden and grow food in today's world when things are go- 
going kind of strange and um, uncertain out there, you know, your ability to um, resolve conflicts and come to peace and harmony with each other. And all of this divisiveness that's out there about reproductive rights and gender issues. What about the wise and sacred use of our sexual energies? You know, the cultivation, like this awareness of the possibilities of conscious conception and bring a more, more, um, kind of a soulful intimate experience with this dimension of our human experience and and indigenous wisdom and on and on so a group like your audience I bet you'll write that out and you'll get pages of holistic things that you've naturally unfolded into by listening to your intuitive guidance your joys and passions when you put that up against what they taught in school you will laugh and say Basically, all the most important things in life, in actual life, through your direct experience of life, that you write out and so glaringly obvious that you imagine going through life without any energy awareness and making a big hot mess of everything. They don't talk about energy at all in school, but you all know that it's critical for life. Imagine going through life with no basics of personal finance, no basics of communication skills or anything. Forget it, right? So in the old system, they would call those either extracurricular activities, right? Like sports, music, um, debate team, all the teamwork stuff, like all of that was extracurricular or is completely omitted. It's not even a subject that you're they consider. So it's the backwards and upside down thing, right? Whereas the all those academics, they're actually kind of like, I feel like they're more extracurricular. They're tools to support you in living a good life. If they come into play, yeah, math can be handy. Learning to read and write can be handy. But there's so many more important things, energy awareness, taking beautiful care of your health that are way more core. And I encourage your nephew and everybody listening to honor and congratulate yourself, A plus, A plus, A plus on all these subjects that are actually truly important for life. Congratulations and realize how brilliant and smart and talented you really are in the real world. Yeah. Well, remembering who you are and why you came to earth could be handy. (laughs) I think that as generations bip along, we're needing less and less um, immersion into 3D earth school and waking up to what our soul is intending becomes younger and younger and younger. Just look at the new world teachers coming through the young ones. Like, yeah, Yeah. I'm seeing on YouTube, like the 20 year olds, the 28 year olds, like channeling and doing the most amazing things. They're not chasing the fame game or the corporate game. They're remembering who they are and why they're here at a young age. And as I was also listening to you this morning and listening to your son, what's your son's name again? His name is Kabrim, also with a Ka. Ka, Kabrim. Mm -hmm. Uh, And how, you know, listening to you talk about how he experienced um, school and then experienced homeschooling and, and fell into that rhythm of his you know what what his body was wanting what his soul was wanting rather than being squashed into a structure and I was thinking if kids were allowed to do that maybe they would have more conscious memory of exactly that of who they are and why they're here and they wouldn't be taught out of remembering that because I think that squeezing us into these systems and structures and routines and schedules does contribute to us forgetting who we are and why we're here don't you think I think yeah um, I'm not much of a conspiracy person but I am a dot connector and I've connected the dot and it just seems like maybe it's the old consciousness has a pattern of energy that is consistent across many things how the medicalization of birth is and how we take the baby away um levels and levels of that poke and prod them and the co-sleeping that happens so naturally is like no don't don't do that spoil your child you would spoil your child put them over there in the crib get them trained do sleep training would cry it out right it starts there right doesn't it It, it's heartbreaking when we we realize that i grew up with that paradigm and somehow i don't know somehow uh, in 2003 i woke up and remembered everything anyway so this this universe is mysterious indeed like i i don't know why i mean i had all these you know regular school 
making me forget, but yet somehow, Karen, you remember too. And we grew up in an old world and somehow our spiritual connection was strong enough to still hold on. So yeah. I don't know. I don't think we're that fragile, but this new generation, they don't want to play this game. And they don't want to, they don't want to go forget and then have to find themselves. They want to just keep that connection alive. And they're choosing families that will conceive in a more conscious way to have soft, gentle, respect respectful birth experiences to transition gradually the first several weeks that my baby was born I just naturally want knew that he, we needed to be close to each other and we did skin to skin for the first like 14 days and every time we napped he would take me he'd be like hey mom I'm so happy to be here in the cos in the world but I want to take you back to the cosmos and we'd go having these dreams flying through together and he would take me to through tours and then we would come back to the physical we did a lot of dancing back and forth between wow. dimensions and it was like such a joyful educational experience for me so there's this gentle not doing this um separation practices and then dropping your child off I know that everybody who has a child if you had choices you would want to keep your child at home longer but the society here in the United States the default is at about six weeks you go back to work many moms and put the infant six week old infant at daycare and then strangers start raising our babies as when we kind of see that that's the society we created, not through any one person's fault, but collectively, we've created this structure. I think if it's time for our souls to collectively choose differently, I would like to choose differently, where it's normal for moms, dads, and, you know, communities to support a smooth, soft, gentle transitions of souls coming to the physical so that they can have that memory intact and uninterrupted and transition very gently into the physical. If we start having educational experiences, classes where teachers are aware of energy resonance, harmonious energies that are non-threatening and non-traumatizing but joyful exciting nurturing and encouraging things like you know if you have a daydream usually you're punished mm -hmm. but my boy who's uh turns out to be quite good at math it turns out how he likes to do math is he says mama when I first wake up in the morning I'm sleepy head but I can grab information from space really easily and then in the evenings, as the sun sets, I can grab information from space easily. So if I do math, before I get sleepy at night, 6 p.m. is my best time for doing math. So he's very clear about that. What child in a school system is permitted to nurture their math skills at this specific window that works just right for his physiology? Right. So we did lots of math, just going to the lemonade stands and the markets and buying fruits and vegetables. And then one day he said, I think I'm good at math. Let's go on the internet and do some math. And so we found KhanAcademy.com and just click, 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 had fun and went through in two weeks, all of grade one, all of grade two math in two weeks, beginning to end. And I was like, oh, that was fun. It proved to me that just by th doing life, you learn all the academics and you can kind of check in, dip into the system once in a while to kind of check in to see where that is at without taking it too seriously. But he kept going and he started telling me, sometimes I like to hang upside down and I can do math better. Okay, go ahead, hang upside down. Sometimes I like to just sit there and grab the information from space. Okay, go ahead, grab the information from space. And then now a year and a half later, he's almost complete with grade seven and he's eight oh. years old. Through a lot of times, he says at that hour, he understands better because he's both sharp here, but he can download the information. And so the new education paradigm, being aware of these multidimensional ways of learning it's just going to become normal in our society because that is the the way that these children are as expansive multidimensional beings, you know. Yes, I remember years ago reading Richard Branson's autobiography. So here is a man who's celebrated for business and being rich and starting lots of businesses. But as a kid at school, he was completely flunking, dyslexic, couldn't read or write, couldn't do maths. And then 
at about 14, 15, <clears throat> he was into music and he started selling records by catalog. And when he started selling records, just like you were saying, when your son was selling fruit at the market, he started to think about math. And that's when he learned, you know, but he couldn't learn sitting down at a rote learning sit down school. And uh, yeah, I remember reading that years ago, because I was exactly like that at school too. It's not just the children, it's the adults. So many adults slip through the system because they just, just can't do the 3D school. And how many of us, like your nephew, let them convince us that we were less smart when right. we were actually in some ways more smart because we're multidimensional thinkers? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm thinking that, you know, kids are forgetting that connection to spirit and soul and who they are and why they're here, either because they're traumatized, like like my nephew, uh, traumatized because they're not fitting into systems, or I've got a, a good friend whose son is a teenager who has been pretty connected up until the hormones kicked in. <laughs> and now he's doing rebellion and, you know, this beautiful, loving, unified being is doing sort of typical teenage thing. And uh, that that sort of teenage thing has has separated him more from that inner knowing. Have you got anything to say about that, about mm, people forgetting? Okay. I do have something to say about it, but I feel um, also humbled by this conversation because my my kids are not yet teenagers. They're still in that sweet phase where we're very close and bonded at home. In the Luminous Education Revolution program, I was blown away by the insights of all the um, teachers and wisdom keepers and innovators of educational solutions that we interview. And almost all of them said how shocked and surprised they were when they hit the teenage years and there was no rebellion. They were almost all expecting it. And there was none. And I kind of wanted to reverse engineer and deconstruct that. It's like, tell me the secret to that. You know, I'm almost expecting that my kids will be embarrassed by me and want nothing to do with me as a teenager, like most teenagers out there. And one of our speakers, um, Masajadi, he he spoke about this idea that as we go through the evolution, many people say there's like cycles of seven years, for example, um, but he kind of divided it as um, those early years as a liquid stage and the middle school type of years as um, as uh, like the preteen years as a gel phase and then the teen years as a solidifying phase. And so this idea that we are so fluid and we're absorbing the frequency patterns of our families and our um, environment all the time. And we're, you know, we all know that children are very adaptive and fluid when they're very young. As they get closer and closer to teenage years, they start to see like, hold on, what are all these frequency patterns that I've absorbed? And do I really want to solidify into it? And so he says, it's like a cake that is going into the oven. At first, it's like, oh, it's just like all the, you know, liquidy and put all the ingredients and start stirring it and let it set. And then as the teenage years, you're about to put it in the oven. And sometimes it's like, wait a minute, I don't want to go in the oven with these ingredients. Backtrack a little bit. Is there anything we can do to take out some of these ingredients and or bake a new cake or something? I, I'm not ready to solidify into it. So he says, if there's rebellion, maybe we can look at what exactly it is. And I've put a lot of thought into it because I see that this generation of children, not just mine, but we're in different educational experiences and play groups and so on. I'm observing a lot of patterns here. And just like you, as someone that can see and sense patterns of energy, what I'm noticing is that in our old generation, those of us that used to be the indigo warrior types, we used to call out the BS when someone is out of integrity with their um, what they say versus what they do. Like politicians always say something and then they do something else and it's out of congruence. It's out of integrity and we'll call out that BS. But these these kids, they're they're primarily energy sensitive. And so they're really listening for the energy and consciousness behind what we do and what we say. And a simple example I often bring up is that many of us holistic families, we want to eat healthy. We don't want to have too much sugar or junk food. So there's two extreme examples as you can say, absolutely not allowed and be rigid and militant about it. And you can be congruent and consistent 
you say that there's no sugar allowed and you do it. And if you, if anybody sneaks a candy into the house, they're punished. You are consistent. There's consequences. But what they're rebelling against is the militant energy. It's not that they don't want to also eat healthy. They don't want the militant's rigid energy. That's the rebellion, right? So this is an example that most people can understand versus, hey, honey, I, you know, I noticed that when I eat too much sugar, my body doesn't feel good. My mind is not so sharp and I feel like I can catch colds and flus very easily if I'm eating not so healthy and my body's more achy, my tummy doesn't feel so good. And since you're my son or daughter, we probably have similar genetics. I just suggest we listen to our body. Why don't you ask your body? And um, it's not that I don't want to allow sugar, but it really doesn't feel good in my body. Or I notice that when you eat a lot of it, you're not so focused and your mind's not clear and you get irritable too. So how about just a little bit? Let's listen to your body. That's a completely different energy and consciousness you bring to the conversation. And then you can be congruent with what you say and what you do. But most importantly, are you congruent with the energy and consciousness? Is it in alignment with a more loving, caring energy? Or is it like um, control, you know, um, rigid or guilt or shame kind of energy? So they are probably not rebelling against what you say or what you do, but the consciousness and energy that is in there. And sometimes it can be a very subtle thing. And there's all of these levels. Is it incongruent with the higher cosmic laws? Because the veils are so thin, especially with the younger ones, that they can see, sense, and feel and know if behaviors and ways of conducting our human affairs feels like the energy of the higher cosmic truths that they came to embody and express. And so they're really here. I feel this generation is here to really bring into congruence and coherence all these levels of our human affairs because they're so, I don't want to say sensitive. They're just awake and aware to these patterns of energy so much more precisely than some of us adults are who've kind of lost our sight in that way. They can see the energy, they can feel it, and they may not have the articulation for it, the words for it, but if we can still ourselves enough to be present and listen for it, like, okay, honey, can you try to explain to me and help me see your perspective? Then we have the opportunity to level ourselves up to their level of visionary possibilities. Otherwise, we try to dull them down to our level. It's a lose-lose game instead of a win-win yeah. game. I can totally see what's going on as you're speaking. Uh, I can totally see. I think that, you know, many mothers like my friend say things to their children because they're coming from a loving mothering space, you know, do's and don'ts. But when you hit that teenage year, instead of being listening to your parents like mum knows best, you start to think I know best. And so you you hear your mother's um, request or command as telling you what to do and you just go into don't tell me what to do ask me what I want rather than tell me what to do and that's where that rebellion comes into play I've got that I've got a great story about what you were talking about with my daughter I was very conscious of that she was my teacher when she was born and I would ask a two-year-old what she wanted for dinner which probably wasn't the best way to parent <laughs> probably could have had more boundaries <laughs> rather than throw all the boundaries out but I would let her listen to what she wanted to eat. And if she wanted sugar and she binged out on sugar, I'd let her do it. And then some days she was just like, just feed me greens. And she would just want to eat greens. But when she was around 10, we were walking into a little shop, a little uh, deli type shop. And there were some soft drinks in a fridge as we entered the shop. And my conditioning to soft drinks, even though I didn't drink soft drinks, sort of kicked in and I thought, hmm, I feel like a soft drink. And so I asked her if she wanted a soft drink, specifically a Coca-Cola, which I hadn't drunk in ages. And she looked at me, she's like about 10, like I'm completely mad. And she's like, why are you offering me that? She's like, no, I want a water. And there was this nice young man walking out of the shop, very well dressed at the time, listening to this interaction between a mother offering a kid a soft drink and the kid asking for water. And he looked like, 
what planet am I on? <laughs> he just looked so confused that the mother would be offering this sweet fizzy drink and the kid would opt for water. So, yeah, that's that letting her listen to her body. And she still does it as an adult. Sometimes she just eats so healthily and sometimes she totally binges on sugar. And so maybe sometimes the body needs more sugar than I. It's such a great way of educating kids. I was not brought up that way and still conditioned into the way I was brought up to eat. But yeah. you're listening, listening to your body. Yeah. And maybe. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes I find myself like we have this uh, wonderful chocolate maker locally and sometimes I eat too many pieces because it's like so good. So we, we joke and sometimes he will be like, oh, just one more piece. I was like, honey, let's take a pause. Let's listen to your body. Do you really need another piece? He's like, no. But sometimes he's the one that's reminding me like, mama, do you really need another piece of that chocolate? I think it's time to put it away. <laughs> so we have this like collaborative. We both agree that these are priorities and it's a very collaborative, respectful energy. And, and there's not, I'm teaching him or he's teaching me. We're both here to be, hopefully bring out the best in each other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, that aha moment for me was with teenagers, rather than telling them what to do, ask them. And if you want to, um, she was telling me about, he was going to a friend's birthday party and she said, are you taking a birthday present for him? And he was like, no, I don't want to look like an idiot. I'll be the only one with a birthday present. And he's sort of screaming at her about what a stupid idea that is. And I'm like, really? But uh, instead of like saying, you should bring a birthday present, that wouldn't it be nice? Don't you like birthday presents? It would be great to receive even if nobody else brings it. Just think how that would feel. Like it's just a different way of communicating with them, right? Rather than telling them what to do. Don't tell them what to do. Ask them what they want to do. Yeah. And, and get yeah, there. It's nice to start that, start that at a young age in an age appropriate way, of course, when yeah. they're really little, instead of saying, what would you like to eat is say, honey, um, I'm looking at the fridge. We have um, right now you can have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have some noodles here, or we can make a little salad. Just give them a few choices. choices. But the idea is the energy is that I honor and respect you. I, I'm here to support and facilitate your path. And you are ultimately the boss and leader of your own body and this life. I'm here to just support and facilitate that. You know, yeah. that, that energy starts all the way from really from preconception Absolutely. all the way through how we speak with our infants into in the teenagehood and hopefully into adulthood and it's yeah. a collaborative, beautiful experience that is so much more rich and rewarding than I ever imagined. This whole parenthood journey has been completely magical and mystical and incredible beyond anything that I had imagined. Oh, that's so beautiful. Well, we've been, I'm just looking at the time. Edith was asking me how long it'll go for. And I said, like, I try to squeeze them into an hour, but there's just so much to talk about. And uh, I think we're coming up to two hours now in this conversation. There's, there is so much to talk about. But, yeah, we'll definitely get you back because I love this conversation about the, the new kids and the new education system and how to educate them. It just, yeah, it's such a powerful, powerful conversation. Is there anything you'd like to leave with us before we go tell people about? This education conversation, I hope that we get an opportunity to chat more. A lot of it is that is is really inspiring us to go back through and clean up our past upbringing too, so that we can all step into this new way of being human that these kids are leading us into, but we're all doing it, whether you have children or not, whether you're a teacher and educator, we're all doing the same work right now. Yeah, it might seem like it's a conversation about kids, but it's really about all of us. So I'm so happy, Karen, that you're here on the planet together with me. And all of you guys who are, I know that this is a very, very special audience. And the message, I want to reiterate the message that my three and a half year old girl said when she was being conceived and in utero was just, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really? It hasn't oh. been easy to hold the light in the intensity of all the denseness in this world. You know, I, 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 we've all been through some thick and thin in this lifetime. 
Yeah. And somehow we held on to our light. Somehow we forgot for a while and then we remembered again. So what a beautiful time to be alive and so, so blessed to, it's like this time code got unlocked and we're all finding each other right now. So yeah, yeah thank you everyone for being here right now. And we're what, all doing it together. This transition is so beautiful. Thank you. What's your daughter's name? Her name is Akira. Akira. Yeah. Mm, beautiful, beautiful names. Did they give you their names? Kabrim is because when he visited, he always had the bring sound and then this orb of light would show up and like, hello, mama or future mama, I'm here again. And so um, my husband said he, once my husband met him in a dream, it was like, oh, he has a very dynamic personality, like kaboom and, and, or sunbeam or something. He was like, this is an energy. And so I knew that calm and light body and yeah. then and then I just come we combined ka and bring and yeah and so yeah when he was born we I asked him do you like this name and he did you know and our girl our girl was um I heard the sounds it sounded like Akira but I was like is this Alina or Serena or Catalina or uh, uh, e, uh I heard uh, e, uh. I heard these sounds and because we had a home birth, unlike in a hospital where you have to make a birth certificate as a home birth, you have plenty of time with the paperwork part. So we just took time and I just met her and I got to know her in the physical and we would be waking up at two or three o'clock in the morning. I'd hear like, ah, e, ah, I like kept, it's like, come on, turn up the volume a little bit, help me to hear. And so I bumped my elbow into Dave, my husband, and like, help me find. And then he said, oh, it's Akira. And he fell back asleep. <laughs> In the middle of the night, he kind of dreamed it and he fell back asleep. I'm not sure he even remembers saying that to me. Wow. I said, yes, it's Akira. Do you like it? Akira. And baby smiled. And then that's how we knew that was her name. Oh, that's beautiful. I remember when my nephew came to me in a dream, he told me his name was Jasper. And I went to my sister-in-law and I said, I met him and he told me he was a boy because I thought he was a girl because he was so pretty. I'd seen him before and I thought he was a girl. And uh, she said, that is my favorite name, but my best friend called her son Jasper. So I can't, I can't call him Jasper because she'll think I'm copying her. And so she called him Thomas. It, so does it matter that parents don't like listen to the soul's request for their name, do you think? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I mean, eventually, as we grow up, I think, um, I think you can you change know, just it. Like, yeah, just like just like me and all of my spiritual friends, half of them have spiritual <laughs> names anyway. So yeah. I think we listen for that. But I, it is some um, is I think it's helpful for the parents to let their children know, hey, when I really tuned in, the first name that I heard was this. What right. what re what feels resonant in your body when you hear these sounds right now? And yeah. do you want me to help you change your name back or something? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, sounds have vibrations and they they produce energy. They so do. It is, they do. Yeah. As I think of him as a Jasper rather than a Thomas, it suits him so much better. Mm. Just the energy of it. But anyway, thank you so much. It's been just such a delight such a delight I can't tell you I was so looking forward to this and I've loved every minute of it you are just amazing I think you're awesome thank you again for speaking with us today on the show Edith it's been beautiful yeah thank you thank you thank you to the audience what a beautiful session we had I loved our conversation too I look forward to the next one Wow, such a fascinating conversation with Dr. Edith and Buntu Chan. <laughs> I loved hearing about her name at the beginning. Uh, yeah, just wonderful, just wonderful. She's a mover and shaker and doing amazing things. And uh, she's starting a new platform, bringing together amazing teachers from all over the world that are teaching the new education system, which will be fabulous. So my despondency in seeing how the education system doesn't service, you know, the new human, the new kids that are coming in for the most part, many of them, not all of them, some kids just slip in and they thrive. 
but uh, you know they're, it's getting more and more and more like I was one of those kids that the education system didn't serve because I was creative and intuitive and didn't do rote learning and so you know here am I in my 60s now and then I've seen my nephew go through it but the more and more children are coming in they called us the indigos uh, or the first waivers, you know, the healers, they're structured differently, they learn differently, they think differently. So many dyslexic kids or, or yeah, as I was saying, Richard Branson was one of those. Like they're brilliant, but they just don't do the rote learning thing. The, their dyslexia is a, a different way that their brains are wired and the way they think, more fluid, more open, less structured, more creative. Yeah, it's interesting. So to see someone like Edith putting this stuff together and uh, putting this information out there and gathering information from parents and groups and spiritual teachers, it's exciting to think that, uh, yeah, this stuff's happening. It's finally happening. It's finally happening. I've got so many friends and family that just have children that, yes, just don't fit into the old structures anymore. So the new structures have to be created, you know, without um, it necessarily being, as she said, a, a homeschooling thing. There can be new ways of educating in communities. Mm, very exciting. Anyway, what do you think of that conversation? Tell me which part that you liked and because uh, we went through a few parts of her awakening story and the part where her son was talking to her from the other side of the veil. He called it space babies. I would say that was the vernacular of a little kid who was talking about spirit and what we would call spirit or soul consciousness or, you know, there's so many names for it. He called it space babies. And when he talked about there's all these millions and millions of space babies, I guess he's talking about um, not little babies in baby form floating around in space, but souls in soul form as points of light electing to insert their consciousness into the earth experience and having made that decision in, to the vernacular of a little four-year-old or six-year-old just talking about all these millions of space babies out there in space. So cute, so cute. But yeah, all these souls electing to come to earth and can we communicate with them and ask them what they need, what they want and have that open communication with them before they come. So exciting. I, it's funny, when I gave birth to my daughter, I knew I could do that in an inner knowing, but I didn't know that I could do it in an outer knowing. Do you know what I mean? It's like I didn't understand just how psychic I was at the time. This is over 30 years ago. But I um, I listened to the impulses. But during my pregnancy, I didn't have any conscious communication from her. I thought I might. thought I might have dreams about her and I didn't. So I really didn't know what sex she was going to be when she was born. But then a few years later when I had expanded my field and and done some energy healing courses and understood that uh you know just how psychic I was or that we all are and I'm not special and like owned that then I did have that communication with my nephew yeah I had that not deliberately like I didn't go to bed thinking I'm going to connect with my nephew but I remembered the dreams and the and the communication that I had with him during the night when I was um in another dimension chatting with him yeah perfect beautiful let me know your stories have you got any stories about your kids or your grandkids or friends kids that you've connected to before they've come what they've said to you what they say to you when they're in body about who we all are and what we're all doing here i'd love to hear your stories and please remember if you haven't already subscribed i'm going to hop on about this you're going to be sick of me ah just talking about subscribing again uh, i'm really sort of trying to get the subscriptions up on youtube specifically or whatever platform you're listening to if you're listening on an audio platform please leave a comment and and rate the show because that really helps other people listen to the shows and just like Edith was saying, it's not like I'm doing it because I need to see how many subscribers so I feel important. Actually, I don't make any money from these shows. I've been doing them for coming up to 14 years now. I never charged a cent. Don't put any advertising. Although some platforms that I'm uploading to uh, do have advertising on that I can't control. I can't take it off. So it's not like I'm saying, please make me famous and make me lots of money. It is exactly as Edith said. It is so that these shows are spread and more people can hear them. The more you engage in the shows, whatever platform that you're on, the more this helps the algorithms and helps other people find the shows and find the conversations. 
and uh, yeah it spreads the love and spreads the consciousness across the planet so you pressing a button is making a difference a like making a comment pressing a subscribe button it is actually making a difference on whatever platform you're listening or watching this on so thanks again for the support and the love and if you haven't checked out the book awakened by death do so great stories in there and i'll catch you on the next show bye for now